Good morning. It's, it's such a pleasure to have to ask people to stop talking so that we can be in our service. That's a wonderful um, illustration of our fellowship together. Lord, we thank you for the message of the kingdom, which is your new reality for humanity and the rest of creation. We thank you that now we know not only John the Baptist, who prepared the way, but also Jesus himself, who is the way. Let us draw on the power of your spirit to learn from and imitate both of these spiritual leaders as we seek to live as citizens and representations of your kingdom. Amen. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. How are we all? All right. Beautiful spring day. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads as we, as we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you that in this world of uh, chaos and of strife, you are the one true Lord and King. And we pray, Lord God, that this morning we'd listen to your word and to what you have to say to each one of us, um, and that you'd work in us through your spirit as your people um, to live lives worthy of you. Amen. Um, well, uh, often when I'm um, preparing for uh, sermons like this, I'll go and listen to other sermons. It's kind of cheating, I suppose. But there was um, one chap I was listening to who compared the opening, uh, opening 13 verses of Mark um, to like a movie poster, one of those old-fashioned movie posters, like a good Star Wars movie poster or something like that. And um, what you've got is like lots of action going on, um, but it doesn't all quite make sense until you actually watch the film and you actually watch the, the rest of the, the story. And um, I think in Mark's Gospel, it can feel a little bit like that. You've got all of these um, impressive people turning up on the scene, all these dramatic images going on, and it can be a bit disorienting um, to begin with. Um, but uh, in this particular poster, we've got the appearing of a long-awaited Messiah. Um, he's maybe front and center. And then you've got, like, the prophets of long ago, and maybe they're kind of lingering in the background somewhere. Um, and you've got this mysterious chap in the wilderness who we're going to come back to later on, um, and you've got the skies being torn open as well. You've got this kind of almost apocalyptic um, imagery going on. And then you've got this kind of dark, shadowy figure who kind of, he appears at the end. He's kind of lingering always in the background. 
Um, and then you've gone, I've got Rome as well. We'll see how Rome comes into this as well. So there's lots of stuff going on. And um, I was chatting this uh, through with, uh, this is what Sine has to put up with at home. I was chatting this through of her last night in the kitchen. And, uh, and I think I came to the conclusion of saying, well, if there's one thing you're going to take away from all, all of this action going on, um, it's this. Um, Jesus is king, and that's the best news that this world has got going for it. So if you take nothing else away from this, that's, that's my um, disclaimer. If you take nothing else away from this, Jesus is king, and that's good news. Um, so I wanted to break this uh, section down into um, three uh, Verses 1 to 3, we've got a king like no other turning up on the scene. Verses 4 to 8, um, Elijah. Well, we'll look at Elijah in a bit. And uh, verses 9 to 13, um, the king goes into battle. So the first section then is uh, a king like no other. Mark's gospel um, goes off with a bang. And, and we might not necessarily notice it in the 21st century West. But trust me, in the first century, uh, in the ancient Roman world, Mark's gospel goes off with a bang. Um, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. See, it throws us right into the grit and grime of the ancient Roman Empire. Um, It's a story of a clash of empires. So to put this into context, um, around, I, I think I've, I've mentioned this before, so sorry if you've heard this before, but around 9 BC, um, in, a, in a kind of town in western Turkey called uh, Prying, um, the, the rulers of that city decided to shift their entire calendar around the birthday of Caesar Augustus. Um, and uh, they even, they left us a little inscription on stone And the inscription says the following. See if you can uh, uh, notice any themes here. Uh, It seemed good to the Greeks of Asia in the opinion of the high priest Apollonius of Monophilus Azonitus, since providence, kind of Roman goddess, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, whom she filled with virtue that he might benefit humankind, sending him as a savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. And since he, Caesar, by his appearance, excelled even our expectations, surpassing all previous benefactors and not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done, and since the birthday of the god Augustus, was the beginning of the good news for the world that came by reason of him. So Mark's gospel suddenly sits in a slightly different uh, light when you, when you read that. The beginning of the good news of Caesar Augustus versus the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. So obviously there, there are kind of a few key points of comparison here. Augustus is sent by a divine uh, figure as a savior. Augustus is himself divine. In fact, he was the adopted son of, uh, of Julius Caesar, who was um, deified. He was a son of God as well. And his reign is the beginning of good news. Um, and they both use exactly the same Greek word, um, Mark and this inscription at Priene, which is the the word for good news is euangelion, which you, you may have come across before. And, and this actually changes the way in which we read this phrase. Um, it's not good news like, oh, good news, I've, I found my socks, or whatever it is. It's, it's a kind of royal good news. In fact, it's cosmic good news. I mean, these guys are rearranging their entire year around this guy's birthday, for goodness sake. This is cosmic royal good news. And so this is, in Mark's gospel, the announcement of a new king who is literally going to change the universe. So reading Mark in the first century is a bit of a dangerous pastime. You're reading a scroll about good news about a new divine royal figure. But Mark is going to go on to show us that this king is nothing like Augustus. Um, And it's a story that's not just embedded, of course, in the Greco-Roman culture, but it's also steeped in the ancient Jewish scriptures. 
So the next thing that Mark goes on to say is, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, he will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Um, Now, whenever you come across a a quotation from the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, the, the, the guys... Um, who wrote the New Testament, they're nerds. And so they're, they're nerds about the Old Testament, and they just expect you to know the entire context from where that quote came from. And if you're anything like me, um, as a 21st century Westerner, that's often a little bit tricky. So you have to go and do some rummaging around. But I suppose it's, Mar- it's Mark's equivalent of um, something like a Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And you're just meant to put all the whole scene together and you're like, oh yeah, the witch and the house and all this kind of stuff going on. So Mark kind of, he takes these two quotes, actually two quotes, one's from Malachi and one's from Isaiah, and he splices them together. And we're going to focus on the, the quote from Isaiah um, chapter 40 first. Now you don't need to go there, I'm going to read it out for us. Um, but again, hopefully you'll pick up on some of the themes going on in the background. So I'll give you a bit more of the context. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, and the rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And a bit further down, you who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain, you who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. So Mark is bringing these two worlds together, that of the Jewish scriptures and that of the the Greco-Roman world that he finds himself in, in the first century. And uh, the reason why this is important, the reason why that broader context is important, because actually Isaiah 40, from which um, Mark is quoting here, is the beginning of of a kind of new section in, in Isaiah. And um, if you read on from Isaiah chapter 40, um, you, uh, you come across four poems about a servant, and, uh, which culminates in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53 about a servant who will suffer and die on behalf of a sinful people. So Mark is already indicating that whoever this King Jesus is, he's not like Augustus in many ways. So this is royal cosmic good news, but the king promised is going to be very different. Which then takes us on to Elijah. Um, Now, the first part of the quotation in Mark chapter 1 verse 2 is actually from Malachi. He's just kind of putting it under the broader stamp of um, Isaiah. But uh, if you knew Malachi again, um, you'd know that the last one of the last lines in the book of Malachi is, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And in the Jewish tradition, it's Elijah who will turn up before the Messiah arrives. Um, Indeed, if you go to Mark chapter 9, later on, Peter, uh, you don't need to go there now, but if you were to read it later on, Uh, Peter actually asked Jesus, as they're coming down the mountain, they've just seen Jesus transfigured on this mountain, and that kind of freaked them out a little bit. And uh, not only that, but they also saw two other figures appear on the mountain with Jesus, Moses and Elijah. Um, And as they're coming back down the mountain, Peter, you know, he's already kind of made a bit of a fool of himself at this point. But he kind of, he asked Jesus, you know, why do, they, why do the teachers of the law and everyone say that Elijah must come first? So this is a thing, like this is a, this is a theme um, in, in the Jewish context. And even to this day, um, at uh, Passover, uh, which obviously uh, been fairly recently, um, the Jews will leave out a fifth cup um, at the Passover meal, and they leave it there for Elijah. 
as they expect the coming of the Messiah. This is still a thing. This is still a theme um, today. I always feel like it's a bit like leaving out um, you know, a cup of uh, milk and cookies for, for Santa. I don't know if it's the same sort of thing. But, um, but, uh, but they leave out, and I don't know who drinks it later, but um, there we go. Anyway, so they leave out this cup for Elijah as they're waiting for the Messiah to come. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 4, who should turn up on the scene? A slightly odd bloke called John who has an interesting dress sense and an organic diet. Um, he lives out in the sticks. Slightly bizarre. The Bible's sometimes slightly bizarre, and that's okay. Um, so what is this guy up to? Uh, why does Mark feel the need to tell us about his dress sense, where he lives and where he works, and about what he eats? Well, John has been portrayed as the new Elijah. Like Elijah, he wears animal hair and a leather belt. It's all the rage, apparently. Uh, Like Elijah, he lives out in the wilderness. Like Elijah, he relies on food provided for him in in the wilderness. And like Elijah, he is about to hand over the prophetic mantle at the Jordan River. So every detail in this passage um, matters. And John, as the new Elijah, is getting Israel ready. He's preparing them for the Messiah. And he does so by getting them to repent and to turn to God for forgiveness. And he's doing this at the Jordan River, which is, there's there's no coincidence here. It's not like he just found a nice uh, patch of water that wasn't too polluted. Um, um, He's gone to this place because this is the place where Israel passed through the waters into Israel, into the Promised Land, many, many years beforehand. He's starting a revival movement, if you like, and all these people are streaming to him to pass through the waters in baptism and come out the other side to start again, as it were. And in verses 7 and 8, he says, we get the following, and this was his message, after me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you of water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's pointing to the one who can give them new life, Um, the one who's going to baptize them with the Spirit, the bringer of life from the very beginning of the Bible. And this takes us into the final section, um, the king goes into battle. Now, Jesus, as the head of this new Israel, also passes through the waters in baptism, Um, After Elijah, we move to the Messiah. After John, we move to Jesus. And at the baptism, we see the Spirit descend on Jesus like a dove. I know in lots of um, Christian artwork, the the Spirit is depicted as a dove, but it's actually, it's just like a dove. But the image is significant. Um, And this is where Mark, again, he's a a Bible nerd. He's doing something quite clever here. Um, The first time we ever encounter the Holy Spirit, Page, page one of the Bible. And what is the Spirit doing? It's hovering over some waters. Um, and uh, the, the verb that's used, merachefet, is that literally used elsewhere to describe a bird hovering over their nest. But here the Spirit is hovering over the, over the waters. And in Genesis chapter one, it's ready to bring new life into Uh, a world devoid of life. So as the Spirit descends on Jesus as he's in the waters, we can expect that new life is on the way. New creation at this point is breaking into the present through Jesus. Now, there are lots of other things that could be said in this um, passage, um, and particularly on this wonderful Trinitarian scene where the Father affirms his love for the Son through the person of the Spirit. But I just wanted to quickly turn our attention to uh, verses 12 and 13, because they they can seem a little bit strange. Um, Because what happens next is the Son, who's just been assured of the Father's love for him, is sent out into the wilderness to face evil personified. Um, This is one of those where I think um, Bible translations are really, really good, uh, but sometimes we're a bit too English. The English says he was sent out into the desert. 
Um, the Greek is actually, he was thrown out into the desert. It's actually ek, out of, and balo, to throw. It's just he's thrown out into the desert. So this is all a bit strange. The son who's just had the father's love affirmed to him is thrown out into the wilderness. But again, this is very deliberate. There are a couple of other humans who were thrown out into the wilderness. Adam and Eve were thrown out into the wilderness, except that Adam and Eve were thrown out into the wilderness because they failed to stand up to evil personified. Jesus has been thrown out into the wilderness to go and do battle with evil personified. This figure, this shadowy figure lurking in the background, the Satan. And um, Mark's account is, is pretty brief, especially compared to uh, Matthew and Luke's account of this. We don't get any dialogue between Jesus and Satan. In fact, the conclusion is actually a bit unclear initially. Um, you know, does he win? Does he not win? This is all really good suspense. That's what Mark's doing. And Jesus, as the new Adam, is also the new Israel, spending 40 days in the wilderness where Israel spent 40 years. And he succeeds where Adam and Israel failed. And then we, this last line has always intrigued me. Um, I went to it and did a lot of head scratching on this one. We get a strange line at the end about wild animals and angels. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Mark's the only one that throws this line in there. Um, Jesus spent time with, with the wild animals and the angels attended him. Um, but this is actually really clever. Um, again, you just go back to the beginning. Like, who spent time in harmony with creation, with the animals at the beginning. And so Jesus, again, is this new Adam who is at peace with creation. Um, but he's not, just, he's not just a new human because the angels are attending him. They're waiting on him hand and foot. And Mark's giving us this little hint that maybe he's, he is fully human, but maybe he's something slightly more as well as the angels attend him. Now, um, we know that he is victorious. Just sorry, spoiler alert, in case you want to you know, come to us later. Spoiler alert. Because the next thing he does after John is put in prison, um, I don't want to spill over into this too much, but he then, what does he do next? He goes into Galilee proclaiming the good news, the euangelion, the royal good news. The kingdom of God has come. So, we know he's victorious because as this royal good news is proclaimed, he's, he's won. And ultimately, he's going to win this victory at the cross. I don't know exactly what we're expecting to see when we're told that God's kingdom has arrived. We're probably not expecting to see the world as it is now. Um, I, this is not a new question um, it was definitely a, a problem for the earliest disciples of Jesus. Um, remember that uh, encounter that Peter has with Jesus just after he declares that Jesus is the Messiah? And Jesus then says he's got to suffer and die. And Peter's like, mm, that's, no, that's not how being a king works, Jesus. It's not how being the Messiah works. You, you have to go and you know, take out Rome. You've got to go and you know, take control of Jerusalem. And Jesus' response is remarkable. Get behind me, Satan. He sees the real enemy at work here. He says, I'm not going to be like an Augustus. I will not be like the rulers of this world who takes life. I'm going to give my own. So he's not going to be like any of the kings of this world. And that's why the world with God at the helm might not look how we... Uh, would expect it to, to look. But this king, instead of launching a rebellion against Rome, he goes straight to the heart of evil and defeats it at its source. And instead of taking life, he's going to surrender his own. I mean, he could. He's at the Jordan River. He could just storm straight up to Jerusalem and go and you know, launch a popular rebellion and take control, but he doesn't. He goes out into the wilderness instead. And I think this kind of hits home in a number of really significant ways, but it means that in this world, before the return of Jesus, following him is going to be really hard. 
following a crucified Messiah is going to involve us taking up our crosses. But through his life, death, and resurrection on our behalf, Jesus' kingdom has already broken into this world. But it won't look like any other kingdom. With so many kingdoms bent on taking life, this king is bent on surrendering his own. And the end is certain. This dark, shadowy figure that he encounters in the desert has been defeated, even if it appears that Caesar is still on the throne. Um, In a world like this, it's actually pretty difficult to follow Jesus. I don't want to make that sound like it's something easy. There's lots of competing saviors out there to give our allegiance to. There's lots of competing kings. But Jesus, who baptizes us with his with his life-giving spirit, is the only one who gave himself for us. He's the only one, the only king who can give us life. Um, A few years ago, and I'll finish on this, a few years ago, um, a sixth form class uh, I was teaching noticed that I was a big fan of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. and Some of you have probably already noticed that as well. Um, But uh, one of the things that struck me about Bonhoeffer was here's this German pastor in the Third Reich who gave his allegiance to King Jesus above all other kings, and he paid for it with his life. And uh, so uh, on a module that was meant to take two weeks to cover, I think I spent about four on it, and my class definitely noticed this. So when they left, they were really kind, and they um, gave me a little photo frame with with this quote in it, and uh, it uh, says the following. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. Let's give allegiance to this king. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the good news that you are king. And we pray, Lord God, that you would guide us through your life-giving spirit, that you would um, enable us to follow you even when it's hard. And we know, Lord, that even when we fail, that you have covered for us. But may that spur us on to be more faithful to you in all that we do. Amen. Yo
The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Nothing we have is ours, but rather everything is a gift. The money we have earned, the houses we live in, the cars we own, all a gift from God. In a world where belongings shape people's identities, we pray that we would live distinctively, in full knowledge that the earth is yours, God, and everything in it. We lift up those who are without the basics. We continue to pray for CAP and BSIM and the Catherine Cookson Foundations. May we use what has been gifted to us and gift to others. You, Lord, reign over all things. In a moment of silence, we all lift to you anybody we know or a charity we're aware of who are in need of your kingdom to come. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Not one of us is worthy to stand in your presence, let alone ascend your mountain. Yet your son gave himself as a sacrifice so that we can stand before you with clean hands. Easter is a time of great reflection of Christ's death and resurrection. May we not turn from Easter, but rather meditate on his message continually. Help us in the face of the world of attraction that stands before us. Help us to stand firm in you. Help us to turn our eyes away from the idols and the gods of this world. Help us rather to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is King. In a moment of silence, we reflect on the beauty of your Son and what it means for us to have him as our King. They will receive the blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Thank you that you have guided each of us to your blessings. Thank you for the promptings that you have placed on our hearts. Thank you that you have called us to you. We bring before you those who we know and with every part of us would like them to also come to know you. We lift up each and every one of these friends, family members or acquaintances to you, Lord, and ask that you, too, would prompt them to seek your face. Lift up your your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up and you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Heavenly Father, there are so many so-called kings in this world, and we turn now to you in prayer for the drone attacks that happened last night. We pray first of all for the people of Israel, Iran, and Gaza. We pray for the politicians and ask that you would give them wisdom. We pray also for the medics, for hospitals and aid workers. And finally, Heavenly Father, we lift up your people gathering today and we pray therefore for the churches in these countries. We pray that you would continue to be the Prince of Peace. And ultimately, Heavenly Father, we pray that we and all others would come to see you as the king. And as a church family now, we turn to your teachings and we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, 
now and forever. Amen.